Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot and I'm the program manager for the Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today. And for our friends at Generations for hosting today's session, Antibiotic Stewardship in the Outpatient Setting, Now Less is Better, with Dr. Susan Jacobson. Dr. Jacobson recently retired from clinical infectious disease practice as chief of her department in Fremont San Leonardo hospitals and clinics at Kaiser in Northern California. Her initial work in ID was in Berkeley, California as the AIDS epidemic hit. Her practice included HIV care with clinical research, general ID and antibiotic stewardship. Dr. Jacobson occasionally traveled internationally for medical volunteer trips, which included rural Kenya, and one of once to St. Peter, St. Petersburg, Russia. She also spent an, uh, a summer studying Russian language when it was in the Soviet Union. Dr. Jacobson currently looks to international volunteer activities as the world reopens from the pandemic. Her clinical practice in medicine has been bookended by HIV and COVID-19, and we are so very lucky to have her. So Dr. Jacobson, I'm going to share my screen. And when you are ready, maybe I'm gonna share my screen. Please begin. Come on. Absolutely. And then you can move it to perfect. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for being on um, this uh, webinar. And um, as I uh, retired, one of the most striking things that has happened in um, infectious disease and in treatment is an approach where perhaps we don't need quite as many antibiotics or the duration. So we'll go over some things. Some things are very, very common um, for you. And um, next slide, please. Okay, our disclosures, we can go through those. Thank you, thank you. Next, all right, and these are our objectives. Um, one of the things that's important is to appreciate what local practice patterns are and understand that sometimes habits really are not necessary. Uh, local antibiotic resistance can evolve um, based upon what antibiotics are being regularly prescribed in that area. We all know the challenge of C. diff and the antibiotic choice does make a difference there. We're gonna talk a little bit about antibiotics that are not indicated settings where perhaps you've used them in the past, but uh, maybe I don't need to. And then occasionally, if and when more is needed is important. Uh, our shorter treatments don't always work. Um, and one of the, the challenges is um, helping patients know that just giving antibiotics is not always better. And I'm sure you're challenged with that. And sometimes there are approaches for that. For example, giving the, well, I can put the antibiotic order in and you can, if you need it, you can pick it up or having a virtual order or a paper order. And then looking to um, settings where you can get some free updates as I was put, um, updating this set of slides, I reviewed the CDC slides. They definitely have some nice stuff on antibiotic use and guidelines from IDSA um, are also available. Next slide. So this is really striking. The antibiotic prescriptions um, per 1000 population by state is remarkably variable. Um, you will see on the left side, um, you'll see very, um, minimal, anti less antibiotics are used on the West Coast and some on the East Coast. And then in the far South, there is quite a bit of antibiotic prescribing. We estimate that 80 to 90% of human antibiotic use is um, in the outpatient setting. So what we do in the outpatient setting really does matter. And as you likely know, we see evolving antibiotic resistance, and that's a significant threat. Next slide. So what is this antibiotic stewardship? The goal here is to um, really define the appropriate selection dosing based on the indication and the patient, whether they're immunocompromised, whether they're very old, very young, the cost plays a role and the evolving antibiotic resistance, i.e. right drug, right duration, right dose. Next. So what are their goals? We'll go through this fairly quickly. Next. Uh, we want to maximize efficiency, improve patient safety, minimize cost, 
extend the lifespan of antibiotics that we have available now and decrease C. diff. Next. So what have we been successful in doing some of this? Um, Multidrug resistant gram negative infections um, in a, a recent study showed decreased from 37% to 8% um, by choice of antibiotics. Next. Um, and then the odds of developing C. diff at the same time also has decreased. Next slide. So I looked on at the CDC slides, and um, on the left is one from a little bit earlier. Viruses are bacteria, what's got you sick? Now the version is on the right, but viruses are bacteria, what's got you sick? And um, I think it's really helpful. These, these can be used as um, uh, slides or uh, posters in your offices, um, and really just reminding um, patients that they don't always need antibiotics. Um, the ones that are obviously important, strep throat, whooping cough, which has been a bit of an issue, um, and significant urinary tract infections. Um, sinus infection can be a little bit moderate. Um, sometimes they go, uh, go uh, away on their own, and we've learned that middle ear infections similarly. Um, and of course, um, we don't need antibiotics for um, routine sore throats. It's only for strep. Um, and next slide. Uh, you can move, thank you. So we have a lot of conditions that we might want to discuss. Um, and we're gonna go over the less is often better. Those are the ones on the left. We're gonna talk about the particularly acute bronchitis, pneumonia, UTI, pyelo, diverticulitis, cellulitis. Diabetic foot infections um, and infectious diarrhea are important. We're probably not gonna do those specifically. Think about if there are some specific questions. And then there are some things where more may be needed. C. diff has definitely become a challenge for many of us. Prevention is really a goal, but treatment options um, are evolving. Um, and one of the things where um, we know that um, STDs, we do have to be very careful with um, improving the diagnosis of monkeypox. Um, there's been some interesting comments on appendicitis. Rather than surgery, you can use antibiotics. and um, that is certainly evolving. We will not be specifically talking about HIV, AIDS, COVID, tuberculosis, or drug resistant organisms. All right, next. So let's move on to bronchitis and pneumonia. So let's initially think about what acute bronchitis is. It is a self-limited inflammation of the airways. Um, it probably affects uh, one in 20 adults annually. It's very common. It is um, the ninth most common illness recorded annually by physicians. And I kind of think about it as having the airways having a sunburn. Um, the epithelial cells desquamate and they denude the airways large more than small. And with that, there's a lymphocytic cellular infiltrate. And thinking about that, we appreciate it is an inflammation more than an infection. Next. So what are the causes? Well, we have many. Um, flu, influenza, um, with ha which has its own treatment, Tamiflu, Asatamivir. Parainfluenza doesn't have treatment. RSV doesn't have treatment, although it now has a new vaccine for the elderly. Um, and um, coronavirus has antivirals. And then many other viruses do not. Now, um, Bordadella pertussis may have a role. Mycoplasma certainly does with azithro. Chlamydia pneumonia, azithro. So let's move on and see what we've learned about treatment for acute bronchitis. Next slide. Um, so these are a re remarkable um, series of placebo-controlled antibiotic trials in adults. Um, and I pulled this over years ago, and um, you can see some very commonly used antibiotics in which some of them probably have been the ones that you've used. 
here we go. Um, doxycycline in the year of 1976. Um, it, this is placebo controlled, no benefit. Uh, trimethoprim sulfa, cough days decreased from 6.9 to 6.5. Another doxy study, erythromycin, no benefit. Erythromycin, low symptom score. Doxy again, doxy again. Erythro, no benefit. Um, one of the ones that I loved the most relative, oh, over 20 years ago was azithromycin. And this was a study in 02 comparing azithro to low dose vitamin C, and there was no benefit. So you can appreciate that acute bronchitis per se does not have benefits from antibiotics. However, many people are in the setting where they're, well, do they have bronchitis or do they have pneumonia? And so sometimes the antibiotics are given. And of course, there are settings where the um, immunocompromised person, the recurrent, um, someone with cystic fibrosis, all those situations, rarely antibiotics are needed. Next. So um, what are non-antibiotic treatments for acute bronchitis? Of course, vaccination, you know, best ways to prevent influenza illness absolutely helps. Um, bronchodilators can sometimes help in the face of acute bronchitis. Um, the, um, uh, there can be a, uh, almost a half, 50% uh, decrease in the presence of cough if people are given bronchodilators for acute bronchitis. Um, and a moderate number of people do report that there's been some benefit with the albuterol therapy. Um, um, in people with chronic cough, not due to asthma, probably it isn't necessary or it is not necessarily going to help. Um, and uh, hypertropium bromide um, it, uh, is also um, something helpful for cough suppression. So it's helpful to remember that you have other treatment options for the person who walks into your office with acute bronchitis. And one of the things that was, is also helpful is that if you are still having problems one week or 10 days later, you know, contact the office, or if you have a fever, contact us or you know, advice like that. All right, next. So um, how do you know that the person doesn't have pneumonia? Um, well, the vital signs, heart rate's not so high, respiratory rate's not so high, and the, temp and, and, um, the lack of fever. Um, your physical exam, um, uh, is helpful. Um, it isn't always proven. Um, the um, absence of focal consolidation, the E to A changes, Riles, egophony, fremitus, um, where you don't have any of that, um, you know, it's less likely the person has pneumonia. Um, and one of the things is the elderly may not have the fever, they may not have necessarily abnormalities. And of course, if you're not sure, you get that stat chest x-ray and you're really comfortable that they don't have pneumonia. All right, next. So um, this is actually a HEDIS measure um, so that um, it is trying to decrease the use of antibiotics um, in this particular um, uh, situation. And um, this is a measurement of how well we're not overusing antibiotics if we're, if we're trying to avoid treatment with bronchitis. And with that, let's move on. So this is a slide taken from my um, former practice in Kaiser, where we've talked about CAP, that's community-acquired pneumonia, hospital-acquired, and um, ventilator-associated. And we're not going to focus on the um, HAP and VAP, but the community-acquired pneumonia um, uh, approach where um, a person can get a dose of ceftriaxone, which can be certainly given in your office um, with um, uh, doxycycline. Um, and that had been our approach with doxy versus azithro because of the QTC prolongation and higher risk of C. diff with azithro compared to doxy. There is um, increasing uh, uh, comfort level with doxy. Um, Absolutely, the price right is um, reasonable. Um, and then certainly in the face of a severe pen penicillin allergy, um, levofloxacin is a very reasonable approach. Now in the person, um, in the person who has a penicillin allergy, um, 
with that does not necessarily mean a cephalosporin allergy. Cephalosporins are frequently um, fine. Uh, we're going to skip the hospital and VAP, um, and we'll move on to the next slide. And um, we'll, our next topic is uh, the UTI. Next slide. So do we need to treat or do we not? Um, one of the things that has been very important is to really differentiate urinary tract infection from asymptomatic bacteria. Um, if you have a positive culture with no symptoms, the real important things to remember are don't treat it. Um, there are a couple exceptions, but in general, asymptomatic bacteria is not to be treated. And doing a urine culture without a urinalysis doesn't provide you much information. So um, the testing, definitely you want to take a look at the urinalysis um, with pyuria. It's helpful. Um, positive urine culture. I don't know that anybody does gram stains anymore, but there are some uh, quick tests as well. Um, I've, in the face of increasing drug resistance, I'm a big fan of going ahead with um, a culture as well as a simple urinalysis, because as we see evolution um, of evolving resistance, then it's much better to know uh, what the organism is and be able to treat appropriately and not give excessively broad antibiotics, quote, just to be sure, unquote. So the signs and symptoms, fever, leukocytosis, urinary frequency and dysuria, and of course, uh, suprapubic te tenderness or costovertebral angle tenderness. Um, incontinence can certainly be um, an, an issue, but incontinence can be um, in, separate from um, ongoing symptoms, particularly in the elderly. All right, next slide. So what do we want to do for empiric treatment? Um, uh, there have been some um, uh, adjustments in the current um, guidelines. This was an earlier version of the IDSA guidelines, Ceftra, Macrobid, or Sphosphomycin. And now, next, Ceftra's out because E. coli resistance has gotten to be greater than 20%. And Phosphomycin, we're also trying to minimize use so we can save it for later. So next. So we're trying to minimize the use of antibiotics, but use something empirically that's pretty good. So Macrobit is it. Next. What about the fluoroquinolones? I'm sure you've uh, prescribed fluoroquinolones for um, uh, UTIs, and you're probably hearing maybe we shouldn't. One is that they're very handy for a lot of other things. So um, there is increasing resistance. We want to save them. We want to save them for um, pseudomonas when we need it. And because of the um, quality of levofloxacin and moxifloxacin for uh, community acquired pneumonia, probably want to sort of reserve those um, for um, uh, needed um, pneumonia treatments. There are, of course, many side effects and drug interactions, and there's a fairly high risk of C. diff. Next. So um, another approach has been um, for us using a um, first-generation cephalosporin um, for pyelonephritis, um, and that has actually um, much uh, stronger, more potent um, uh, than the macrobid. Um, the choices include um, cefadroxyl, which is a BID dosing um, of Keflex. You may or may not be that familiar with cefadroxyl. It is now generic, pretty well tolerated. And compared to Augmentin, um, it will have less C. diff risks. So cefadroxyl um, and pushing the dose for a UTI. Cefpodoxime is another option, um, also for um, UTI and pyelo. And of course, if we have, if you have somebody who has suspect pyelo that you're trying to treat in the community setting, um, you want to wait, you want to adjust based on the urine cultures. Next. Um, and with that severe um, penicillin allergy, yes, we could use ciprofloxacin or nitrofurantoin or trimethoprim sulfa, depending upon sensitivities. Next. 
And um, what's the treatment duration? Well, cystitis um, for the beta-lactams, it um, is a little longer, seven days for cefadroxyl, ciprolevo, three days. For pyelonephritis, for men, complicated cystitis, the beta-lactams do require a little bit longer treatment versus the ciprolevo, particularly for the pyelonephritis. Um, but duration does not translate into adverse reactions as often because of the, the decreased C diff risk with that um, first generation cephalosporin or the second cefpidoxine. Next. So moving out of specific things, let's think about and talk about the antibiogram. Now, I know many of you are in different clinics, but with a, um, a larger organization. And so Hopefully you do have an antibiogram that is um, relevant to your communities. Um, and it is in incredibly helpful because you will learn exactly in general what the um, data are in your local area for cultures and sensitivity for, for example, urine infections. Um, it will give you the number of isolates and the percent susceptible to various antibiotics. Um, and that is critical information when you're choosing your got to give something today. Now, one caveat is that prior foreign travel can affect what an individual is colonized with. Um, in particular, if people have traveled to an area where there's quite a evolved drug resistant organisms. Um, I was particularly struck by this years ago when um, uh, someone traveling um, to um, India and South Asia, Southeast Asia um, uh, returns and has a remarkably resistant organism. Uh, it's a complicated infection, but this definitely does happen. And as um, some parts of the world have very limited antibiotic, um, narrow treatment and pharmacists can give the antibiotics and there's limited cultures, um, we see evolving drug resistance coming from areas. Now, the person could be colonized with this in their lower GI tract for a long time. Um, and so it isn't that they're necessarily sick one week after return. It could be one month or it could be one year when they get their UTI, but they happen to be colonized with that. So that value of the culture is important. Next. Okay, diverticulitis. Um, this is particularly interesting in terms of thinking about, do we really need to give antibiotics? Now, um, that has not been something that the literature ever supported. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, options on diverticulitis. And next slide. One thing that's important to keep in mind is that it can get very severe. So it's not a just say no to antibiotics. You have to judge the patient um, and um, judge the patient as to whether they're um, a candidate for outpatient therapy or whether they need inpatient therapy. And that's a critical decision on diverticulitis. And um, in particular, um, if you're not sure, making sure that you can either get that ER evaluation um, and or that urgent CT scan, something to help you be more comfortable that local outpatient antibiotic therapy is um, adequate. Now, I looked a little bit um, in uh, the Johns Hopkins Pocket IT Antibiotic Guide, which is fabulous. If I'm not selling it, I have no um, particular um, uh, conflict of interest here, um, but I found it very helpful in my hand, in, in my iPhone, um, in my pocket. And, and um, this is one where I just um, popped their information out of um, Johns Hopkins um, yesterday it was as I was getting this updated talk. So one thing that's important to know is that the role of treatment for diverticulitis is based mostly on retrospective data and clinical experience, you know, i.e. no randomized control trials, very limited. It is the most eighth month, most common outpatient diagnosis in the U.S. So that's pretty common. Um, so you see it in your practice. Um, obviously primary symptoms, you know, well, left lower quadrant pain, intermittent or constant fever, altered bowel habits. And, um, if it's a mild illness, a person is tolerating oral intake and has no, uh, so significant comorbidities, i.e. immunocompromise, um, advanced age, um, 
you know, severe heart disease, you could get in a little trouble, chronic renal failure. And if there's social factors that would limit somebody's able, ability to come back um, for urgent eval or something like that. Um, if, you know, basically if they're a walking, talking, ambulatory person who can keep in contact, it's reasonable to consider outpatient treatment with close follow-up, either a phone or, or a Zoom or um, visit um, two to three days later. So what do we wanna use? Um, and this came from um, the Johns Hopkins group. Um, uh, one, five days are often adequate, which is amazing. Um, options include a MOX clavulanic, um, 500 TID or 875 BID. Um, and the use of a MOX clavulanic is based upon the anaerobic component as well as the aerobic gram negatives. And so your one drug is, is giving both anaerobic coverage and the aerobic gram negatives. However, it does have its own C diff risks. So the other couple options are often very, very helpful. Cipro, 500 BID, uh, and metronidazole, um, often prescribed as Q6. It can be given less often, has a longer duration of action. We frequently used it BID with good effect. It's been difficult for people to tolerate metronidazole at the high dose Q6. Trimethoprim sulfa and metronidazole is also um, often effective. And that is actually um, financially very effective for a person. It's, both of them are very inexpensive. So what about no antibiotics? Next. So there was a recent open labeled randomized trial. Um, the reference is there, Annals of Surgery, um, that took 480 patients with CT confirming uncomplicated diverticulitis, i.e. no abscess, um, and they knew that by CT they had diverticulitis. They were randomized to oral augmentin um, versus pain management alone, and they had a similar rates of return to ER visits, 6.7 versus 7, or hospitalizations, 6 for those with augmentin, or 3 um, with no antibiotics. And that's a really challenging approach. So I think it's reasonable to appreciate, one, um, that it was a randomized controlled trial, so we have some information that you can get away with it, but uh, two, that this was a person who had CT confirming uncomplicated diverticulitis, and presumably somebody who did not have recurrent diverticulitis, where things may be more complicated. What's the evidence for dietary restriction? None. It's habit. We thought it mattered, but it doesn't really. Um, you know, those little, you know, those necessary, those little seeds don't necessarily get stuck. Um, definite reass reassessment if people are not getting antibiotics. Um, and um, if the person is improved, um, no repeat CT is necessary, but, but it may be better to do a colonoscopy six to eight weeks to be sure um, if it's indicated, if they're due for screening for colon cancer, making sure there's no polyps and the like. So this is a, a um, intriguing approach to diverticulitis. Um, this article came out not that long ago. Um, in a quick look, I did not see if there were any new follow-ups um, on the uh, Johns Hopkins Pocket IT. They did not specifically mention this. So it's still an evolving world about whether you can get away with no antibiotics with diverticulitis. Next. Cellulitis, oh, that common condition. All right, next. So um, what was the difference between erysipelas and cellulitis? Well, erysipelas is a very rapid spread and it is almost always from beta hemolytic strep. Cellulitis can also be from Staph aureus. But thinking about that sharp demarcated border and the rapid spread really gives you a sense that this is highly likely streptococcus. And that is very helpful in thinking about your choice of antibiotics. What about MRSA? If you think you have staph as the evidence in your cellulitis, what coverage 
is needed for MRSI? Well, one is to think about if there's um, prior risk factors, um, if there's prior colonization. Oh, they had MRSA five times. I tried to decolonize them, it didn't work. Um, so that's one thing. One is if there's purulent drainage or pus, and if there is, culture it, and you may or may not want to cover for MRSA, but at least you have a culture cooking. So if they don't get better, they can cover MRSA. And if there's systemic toxicity, you may want coverage for MRSA, even if you're waiting on your cultures, because if you don't cover it, they may require hospitalization. Next. So it's important to think about that majority of cellulitis is caused by strep species, and we talked about that rapid onset. And cefazolin, or in the outpatient setting, cefazidroxyl, is very good for strep, and it's very good for MSSA, methicillin-sensitive staph aureus, um, as is dicloxacillin on the outpatient setting, both for strep and for diclox. Now, if you're really convinced it's streptococcus and you don't, you don't need any staff coverage, you can always use good old amoxicillin. Probably you're gonna use cefadroxyl or Keflex. And remember the cefadroxyl approach in the outpatient setting is um, a BID dosing. And one thing you possibly do in your clinic setting is, oh, this looks like a, not a great cellulitis. Why don't I give them a single dose of ceftriaxone IM in the office and send them out on cefadroxyl for a recheck in two, three days? That often saves that hospitalization um, and saves the patient um, uh, problems and, and saves you um, concern about whether they're uh, going to improve quickly. What about um, uh, if you worry about MRSA? Well, in the outpatient setting, you need to add something like doxycycline um, or trimethoprim sulfa. Trimethoprim sulfa alone doesn't give you strep activity, so you definitely would have to do cefadroxyl plus trimethoprim sulfa. Um, the clinical experience with doxycycline for strep also is less. Um, so if you really do need to cover MRSA, you may need to bite the bullet and either give the person linazolid, which is very expensive, or make sure you culture. You can use clindamycin, but clindamycin has its own increased risk for C. diff. And um, um, inducible resistance exists for the MRSA, so it may not work anyway. Um, if you're not sure about the MRSA, you know, patient was in a nursing home six months ago, they've been fine, now they have cellulitis, you may just do a NARI screen and give them, give them cefadroxyl or cef cefalexin. And again, the cefadroxyl is the BID version of Keflex. Why am I not mentioning Augmentin here? Well, Augmentin, again, has that slightly increased risk of C. diff, or not slight, does. So cefadroxyl, first-generation cephalosporins are better. Um, although your Augmentin will cover strep and staph, um, but it has a risk of that C. diff. Next. Moving on to penicillin allergies. Well, one thing to keep in mind is, is it real? Is it real? Is it intolerance or allergy? Dicloxacillin is a good case, case in point. Many people can't tolerate dicloxacillin. That doesn't mean that you are penicillin allergic. If your mother is penicillin allergic, um, you are not penicillin allergic automatically. What about the cross-reactivity between penicillin and cephalosporins? For the person who has not had anaphylaxis to penicillin, that is something that's not IgE mediated, the cross-reactivity with the first or second generation is only about 1%. And with later generations, it's negligible. So you can say, generally safely give a dose of ceftriaxone to somebody with a penicillin allergy in your office and make sure they're fine. Um, IgE mediated allergies, I would avoid the first and second generation cephalosporins. Cautiously, you could use the later generations, but you may not be doing that in your clinic setting. 
Um, there was a retrospective um, study in one of the Kaisers um, in Southern California that looked at cephalosporins widely used and in patients with a history of penicillin and cephalosporin allergy, and they got away with it very nicely. So really think carefully when you see penicillin allergy and don't automatically um, jump to the, the quinolones. Next. All right. C. diff. Well, hopefully C. difficile colitis is not plaguing too many of you in your clinics. Um, and I'm sure that you've seen an occasional person who's come back after their hospitalization with their long course of antibiotics or their nursing home stay and coming back with C. difficile colitis. Next. So before we go on to treatment approaches, one last reminder to avoiding fluoroquinolones. And that is the risk of C. diff. What is the relative risk of C. diff by antimicrobial classes? Here you can see that penicillins, beta-lactam combos, first and second generation cephalosporins and glycopeptides are all not too bad. Um, although increasing when you get to the third, fourth and glycopeptides. Clindamycin is quite high, 3.9 adjusted heart, uh, odds risk rate, then the same for fluoroquinolones. Macrolides, erythromycin, um, doxycycline as well. Aminoglycosides, no, trimethoprim sulfa, uh, a little bit. And then mitronidazole, of course, is, um, does not have C. diff risk because it's a not good treatment. And then just a reminder on the side effects for fluoroquinolones, there is not only the high risk of C. diff, but increasing resistance it is it's our only oral pseudomonal agent, and it's got multiple um, side effects. Altered mental status. Um, occasionally, you see dysglycemias, both hypo and hyper, um, QT prolongation and tendon rupture, and drug interactions. So although they're fabulously helpful in many situations, they're ones where we want to save them for where it's really needed. Next. And we're gonna, this is just another um, image of the various um, agents that are associated and we can pass, but you can have it, have it for your reference. Next. Next slide. So a couple of things to think about with C. difficile in terms of making the diagnosis is that um, people can have asymptomatic carriage and that can affect the choice of antibiotics and in, in, affect the risk of developing C. diff when you have more um, treatment, when antibiotics are needed again. Where do you pick up asymptomatic carriage? Um, obviously, um, it is increased among long-term care and um, hospitalized patients. There have been some outbreaks um, associated with um, meat in various places, um, not typically known, but, but can occur. So if there's a big outbreak happening in your community and outpatients who've never you know, had um, any antibiotics and never been hospitalized or had family members who came home, you might you know, be paying attention to if things were going on. This is a, not a very common thing and not commonly diagnosed. Making the diagnosis is critical. Make it, do the stool test. There's many different types of tests these days. Um, if the initial test is negative, you may need to do a repeat test, or if it's refractory diarrhea, you may need to do a colonoscopy for making a diagnosis of the cause of diarrhea. I am not going to go through all the different diagnostics, um, um, but um, uh, it is relevant to um, be careful on making sure you're making a true clean diagnosis. As we know, antibiotics increase the risk. There are new treatment options. Right, right now, uh, metronidazole is no longer recommended as um, the first choice. It has clearly been documented as less effective, um, and it also has side effects of its own. Um, in comparison, fidaxomycin is better than oral vancomycin, but does have increased cost. Um, um, and um, recurrent disease is um, often difficult, and hopefully you have not had too many of those cases. Next slide. I think um, I am going to go back a little bit. Go back one slide. This is one of my latter ones. And 
I haven't given you all the details on um, treatment duration on C. diff. Um, and um, both the fidaxomycin and the oral vancomycin approaches are um, recommended for a 10-day treatment course. Um, and um, sometimes with a relapse of oral vancomycin, you may move to fidaxomycin for the next. Um, and sometimes a prolonged taper of vancomycin um, can be used. Um, uh, there's not particularly one standardized approach. Um, many trials or people have treated out of um, uh, in, in extreme difficulty, longer and longer tapers, uh, various sorts um, have evolved. Um, there is also um, availability um, a little bit more commercially of a, um, a fecal um, uh, transplant, um, FMT, fecal microbial transplant, and comes in capsules now and can be administered orally or um, through um, a colonoscopy. And for someone with recurrent treatment, a recurrent multiple recurrences of C. diff, that basically recolonizes their gut with um, new bacteria and a much better um, uh, set of bacteria, and that can often decrease the risk of C. diff. So um, uh, you can take a look at the, C uh, the IDSA guidelines for that, and IDSA guidelines are available um, uh, for free. Um, they're also available on an app on the phone. Uh, the app is a little clunky. I'm sure it'll be easier to look them up on your computers at the, uh, uh, at the desktop. So next slide. Um, this is um, uh, sort of a basic uh, set of uh, important infectious disease rules. And I think that they're really important, not specifically for this talk, but for every setting where infectious disease plays a role. Reviewing past cultures gives you an enormous clue as to what's going on. And hopefully you have a good relationship with um, uh, either your local hospital or a regional um, antibi antibiogram, and then your, pro your, your patient's past cultures. Hopefully they sit on your chart, whether your chart is electronic or paper, and you can quickly look through them and go, oh, look at this, he's had a resistant organism before. Well, I have to do a little bit more. The other thing to look at is the size of the person. Um, as we do have increasing um, um, size, we have to think about doses. Um, a big person needs a big dose. Um, you see a person with cellulitis in your often office and you give them cefadroxyl 500 milligrams twice a day, it's not going to work. Um, maybe a big person might even need two grams of ceftriaxone and give them a larger dose, or the big person may need to be hospitalized for their early treatment. So think very much about dosing. Um, and um, in that larger person, also think about the effect of uh, vasculature and edema, because certainly edema, in particular for cellulitis, plays a long role, a big role in delay in recovery. And um, if you prescribe bed rest at home um, and work release, then people will hopefully not go to work and their cellulitis will get better and save them their hospital stay. We always encourage everybody to get HIV tests. We do know that Sometimes um, people don't perceive themselves at risk um, and they are at risk and we don't like to have HIV be something that is diagnosed um, late in their illness because HIV um, is so treatable now that um, it's important to have everybody know their status. Um, and um, for folks who are foreign born, it's also reasonable to think about tuberculosis screening. Fortunately, in the United States, we have relatively low um, active TB. Um, ex however, the foreign born is the largest group of people who are coming um, with um, latent tuberculosis. Um, if you are sitting or working in a place where there's a lot of new immigrant population, you, you want to do that basic um, TB screening. And um, uh, on that foreign born person, you may want to do the TB skin test, the PPD, or you can do um, the IGRA the quantiferon gold or one of the other tests. And um, that can be certainly done on your, if you do baseline laboratory tests, you can get one of those. Um, for, the pe for, for the foreign born person who um, uh, um, gets a TB skin test and comes back to get it read, they'll just poo poo it and say, 
that um, that was because I got my BCG. And to some extent, that's the case, but not completely. So the IGRAs, although a little bit more expensive, um, can provide a little bit better um, data to help that person say, oh yeah, I do the that chest X-ray and maybe I should take some preventive therapy. And as we talked about the penicillin allergy, you know, definitely get a little information on it, outline that in your, your chart, make sure penicillin allergy tolerates cephalosporins or some comment like that. So you can, you can make sure that somebody does know that they can get at cephalosporin. It really makes your life easier when they get an anti, when they need an antibiotic. Next. These are the references, um, and they're very handy. The antibiotic use in the US, easy to find. Um, they have some uh, antibiotic stewardship training if you wanna do that. The guidelines in the IDSA, um, I showed you some um, um, prior um, uh, slides from my prior practice. And then this um, Johns Hopkins Pocket IT Antibiotic Guide is, is very quick uh, for your, your phone in your pocket. Um, and they, I think they have a trial for a month or so that you don't have to pay. And next, so um, taking you out west here, this was uh, in Yellowstone last year um, in January. Uh, questions? All right, thank you so much, Dr. Jay Gibson. Uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions, you can put them into the Q&A box, the chat box, or use the raise hand feature. First question is, so. Oh, that was just a comment, all right. Um, we do not administer IM antibiotics in our clinic. Can you please recommend another outpatient treatment for CAP? Well, depending upon how severely ill somebody is, um, you, can, you can consider the uh, fluoroquinolones. Um, because the fluoroquinolones are better absorbed. And so your levofloxacin or your moxifloxacin, they do represent a higher risk of um, C. diff, as we talked about. Um, and if you don't administer IM uh, injections, you may think about trying to operationalize that in your clinic because the ceftriaxone um, with lidocaine is very technically pretty easy, and it can often spare that person the ER visit um, and also treat your cellulitis or, or, and or your early pneumonia. Wonderful. Okay. Um, I don't remember hearing anything about Defodroxil. Is it readily, readily available at the outpatient pharmacy in the U.S.? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And um, it's it's also called Duracif, that's the brand name. And uh, one of the reasons that we, I'm, I kind of push it because it, it, it's basically many people move from Keflex, Cephalexin to Augmentin based upon the, instead of QID for Keflex, the BID dosing on Augmentin. But Augmentin has the unneeded anaerobic activity and, and the moderately um, increased C diff risk. So we found that using the Cephadroxyl as a BID dosing was very effective, and that often it was very well tolerated, the higher dose of a gram BID. Um, it is now generic, so it should not be too expensive. And you may um, see what your local pharmacy uses. Now, uh, typically, if people don't prescribe it, then they don't necessarily stock it. So you might check your local pharmacy and see if they have it on stock. Um, what about fecal transplant from recurrent C. diff? Yes, FMT, fecal microbial transplant, is very effective. And um, there are a couple different ways to do this. Um, one of them has been using a donor stool from a relative and where they get screened to be sure they don't have any infectious diseases and if they're willing to donate their stool. Um, and then that is given um, through a, either a, generally through a colonoscopy. Um, there is also now drugs that are a, a prescription FMT that come in capsules or come um, in other um, approaches. I believe it comes as 
a slurry that can be used or, or the uh, capsules are dissolved and, and can be used in a colonoscopy. So it definitely has its role. And for somebody with recurrent C. diff, it's definitely worth trying. You may need to get your gastroenterologist involved on something like that, especially if you're going to try for the, um, obviously for the lower GI tract um, administration. How do we treat ESBL? ESBL, extended, extended spectrum beta lactamase um, organisms, very much depend on the sensitivities and what you're treating. So that person may very well require inpatient therapy. They may require um, um, an advanced cephalosporin. They may require aminoglycosides. Um, depending on the resistance, they may be able to get away with gentamicin or amikacin. Um, and so you definitely want your culture data and what the treatment is for. Um, if somebody has an asymptomatic, no symptoms, pyuria, that uh, without pyuria, asymptomatic um, uh, urine, uh, somehow got a culture of the urine done, and they have no white cells in a urinalysis, and they have no symptoms, but it's a resistant organism, then you have to think about what's the indication for treating it. Is it because they are going to undergo some um, surgery? Um, so they need to clear their, their um, uh, urinary tract before an important genital urinary procedure. If somebody's colonized with it, that is, it lives in their gut, but they don't know it and you don't know it, then there's no specific treatment necessary. Great. Um, okay. How would you recommend dealing with pressure from patients or parents to prescribe ABX? Agreed. Um, um, one, uh, a couple different approaches. One, you can work out um, a prescription pad um, um, set of recommendations. So you, you give them a piece of paper that says what you want them to do on it. That is very helpful. So that comes in, comes in with a URI um, and, and they're asking for antibiotics. You very much um, remind them that the antibiotic has its side effects as well. You're not trying to be cheap um, and, and that you also want some feedback from them. Sometimes an approach where you think somebody's not going to need antibiotics for their bronchitis, but they might, you can say, well, I'm going to give you an anti a prescription for the antibiotic, um, or you can file it electronically. And then you can, and if you can do the electronic filing, then that's wonderful because then you can see if they filled it. Um, and then if you're not better, let me know and go pick it up. Um, and sometimes um, for the children, um, you know, you, you, may, you may have to really push that parent to say, we don't necessarily, we, 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 we can do a strep test and wait until the re result is back. Um, and that remind them and teach them about the value. Um, one of the other approaches is there are some very nice handouts that you can look at. CDC has some good handouts for things like this, I think IDSA does too, and and um, and you can post some of those and make sure that people understand that the antibiotic um, is not the only treatment. Um, and for bronchitis in particular, um, a bronchodilator does make help is helpful. So giving a person who doesn't normally have asthma but has a bad cough a good cough suppressant and a bronchodilator is treatment. And that's helpful for them to know that it's really not the bacteria that's causing it, it's inflammation of the airways, for example. All right, doctor, oh, put his hands down, I'm sorry. Dr. Mazzullo, I don't know if you still wanted me to allow you to talk, but put your hand back up, it, I think you did. Okay, mm -hmm. Dr. Mazzullo, you can talk now. This was a wonderful talk, I decided to do it uh, verbally rather than the chat, because my biggest problem is that I was born bef with bef bef the only drug we had was Keflex, and I cannot keep the cephalosporins in my head. Is there an easy article that goes through the first, second, third, fourth generations one by one, explaining the advantages and the disadvantages and what's the best drug to use. I get so confused with the cephalosporins 
and I'm not an ID doctor. And I think that's what makes an ID doctor great. They can keep them straight. <laughs> I absolutely understand what you're talking about. I would encourage you to take a look at that, that Johns Hopkins pocket IT guide. Oh, that's because, very helpful. Good. And because it's it, it has some really nice slides. It, it, it's really quick and really easy. And because if you find it helpful, I think it costs 20 bucks a year or something like that for the just for the ID section, forget the HIV and all the other things, but the antibiotics. And it's also a very quick reference. So, you know, it's helpful when you're trying to um, decide what to do on a given problem. And you're right, um, cephalexin is your first generation cephalosporin, and you're going to add to that cephadroxyl. That's or, right. That's or, a new one for me. Exactly. And we and and part of I'm selling it a little bit. I have no, you know, it's generic. I don't make any money off of it. But uh, we've been. I was really struck by how well it was tolerated by people, very much like Keflex. And and what happens with Keflex is people don't take it four times a day. Never. So right. And so it doesn't work when you're taking a BID, whereas the cefadroxyl is a BID dosing. So it's very helpful. That's great to remember. It really is. Thank you so much. This really clears up so many misconceptions that, that you're right. You know, the resident itis is so prevalent. One resident will start a rumor about the best drug of the day, and mm -hmm. it spreads through the outpatient clinic like you won't believe. And so many people get hooked on just bad ideas. And I think the, the, the reflex to use Cipro for UTIs is so high. And it's hard for an internist to, to do nitrofurdantin or microbid because we've been scared about that pulmonary complication since medical school. Yeah, but that's not for chronic. That's for chronic use, not for. I know, treatment. I know, but people you know? don't know that, and they can't even write it. Their hand gets paralyzed when they have to write nitrofurantin. I no, I understand. I absolutely understand. I, I not not that long ago, I had a urinary tract infection myself. It was like I go out of my way to not take antibiotics, but um, and and my doctor, I'm now retired, so my doctor prescribed it for me. It was I don't know about this. And, and, you know, I've previously taken trimethoprim sulfa, but look at that. My, my bacteria was trimethoprim sulfa resistant. So I guess I had to take the macro bit and it was very easy. <laughs> All right. We have a Thank few more so questions. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Okay. Uh, back to cephalodroxyl. Is, is the only advantage that it has over cephalexin is that it is BID? Price is the same, antibiotic coverage, same, concern for kidney function, the same? Um, pretty much everything. I can't say price, uh, but it, it is a generic now, so it should be relatively inexpensive. And um, the, the tolerability of it um, is very similar to Keflex, but then the duration, the twice daily is a tremendous advantage to the patient. And you can push the dose safely, the, a gram on the larger person, uh, a gram twice a day, or a gram on, on, on more severe you know, concern of low-grade pile or something like that. So um, it's really, think of it as Keflex twice daily. Wonderful. Um, does symptomatic group B strep cystitis need to be treated and with what? Symptomatic cystitis should be treated. And because it's a strep, those are penicillin sensitive. So you could use something simple like amoxicillin, or you could use um, the cefadroxyl because the streptococci. Um, but group B strep, particularly in um, uh, pregnant women, would definitely want to be treated. But if they're symptomatic, yeah, you can treat them. Um, how do you stop just in case treatment? Use in children is particularly dangerous because of risk of developing uh, IV, inflammatory bowel disease. Good question. Um, one approach to think about is um, explaining to the family, to the parents, that less antibiotics are, are, are better for the kids because it cuts down their risk of developing a chronic condition like IBD. Um, and also acknowledging that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of the rite of passage. Kids are going to have coughs and colds, and the cough and cold is, not an, is, is a viral condition, not a bacterial condition, so that the treatment of that is time and symptom management. 
um, it is a fight. There's not going to be a perfect uh, solution to helping um, uh, the the parent um, help the uh, not 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 give the antibiotic. Great. I don't see any more questions, so we'll pause and just wait for those last minute questions. You can get them into the Q and A box for the raise hand feature. But while we're waiting, just a reminder that when you close out of this webinar, the CME survey is going to appear. You do need to complete that survey to uh, get CME credit. But if you miss the tab, not a problem. It'll be in the email tomorrow that comes from Zoom. We'll have the CME survey link and the slide deck. And if you are sharing a computer with anyone, that's great. However, Zoom will only recognize the person that is attended. Even if you put on um, additional attendees, the person that attended is who will get the slide deck in the CME survey. But if you email me your name, I will make sure to get you the slide deck and that survey and mark you here as attending. But with that, I don't see any other questions. So Dr. Jacobson, thank you so much. This was wonderful. And thank you all for attending today. And I look forward to any comments people have um, afterwards. And if they say, oh, I really want a little bit more detail on blah, blah, blah. Um, that would be helpful for the next time I give this talk. I don't think that the topic is going to go away. Um, and I don't think we'll be able to handle in-depth conversations about C. diff, for example. But um, but I think we could we could certainly um, put a few more slides in here that give more give people more data if they would really like to see some more. For sure. Thanks so much. And you can put those comments in the CME survey if you don't want to email me. Um, we do share all feedback, so we definitely appreciate it.